Welcome to the show. I'm Dom Dumas, and I'm in Bangkok. I'm also the official podcaster of the SHL. Michael White of Hooters Nana, episode 47. Welcome to the show, Michael. Thanks, uh, Dominic. Dom. Uh, it's great to be here. I love the studio, and uh, thanks for having me on. Okay, excellent. Well, it, the studio is still a work in progress. I have so much more I want to do to it. Uh, but yeah, I appreciate it. So well, I've learned a lot already. It seems like we've had an interview before we started, but uh, the green screen is, is something uh, I didn't know about until now. So yeah, it's this is actually quite new. I had it. Uh, well, the last time my wife went to England, she uh, we had it ordered and it was delivered to her mother's house. She picked it up for me, and now it's in it, again. It's one of those things. It's kind of first I had it just over this wall, and it didn't quite look right, and then I, I expanded it to go around the whole wall. And everything is just like everything is kind of growing to to f- fill my my desires. I guess you could say I, I get something and it's like, ooh, I can actually do this now, which makes everything exponentially get bigger and bigger. But yeah, I awesome. love it. Awesome. So anyway, great to be here. Thanks a lot for having me. Yeah. Awesome. So uh, first, before we get started here, or as we get started here, uh, just where you, where do you come from? Where are you from? I'm Canadian. Uh, oh, no. Born, yeah, another one. Uh, born in uh, Victoria, okay, which is Vancouver Island, and uh, born in born and raised. Uh, went to school, went to university there, mm-hmm. and then I basically got the hell out of there. <laughs> Victoria is well known for the uh, newlywed and the nearly dead. <laughs> okay. And one thing, I guess, you know, I've I've been uh, in Thailand for 15 years now, okay. quite a long time, and I've got to know a lot of my good friends are obviously other Canadians but one thing I've come to realize is Victoria is a very uh, different part of Canada uh, mm-hmm. there's there's no place like it uh, some may argue in, on the East Coast where I haven't been but we kind of have a micro culture and I know that when I go back there but one thing you know being with the other guys a lot of guys are from Ontario Toronto uh, you know Alberta you know I'd never even been to a Tim Hortons you know okay. before in my life and this is what I'm saying you know I have my own theory about people from islands that they're sort of cut off Mm -hmm. from the mainstream and um but yeah i I came from victoria um and i've been uh, in thailand basically since 2002. okay was there something between leaving there's lots there's lots um yeah i'm I'm actually uh, adventurous eccentric uh, a bit of a, a world traveler um I didn't even start my university degree until I was 23, okay. so, and then it was a bit of a rush to do it. But I've, I've traveled uh, the world, essentially. I did a year in Australia. I did a, wow. a year with a backpack in South America. Okay. Uh, I've done Europe. Um, obviously, Asia is a, a different chapter. But mm-hmm. and I was also a tree planter. It was, it was a big uh, a job in Canada. I was okay. putting trees in the ground for basically every summer for six years uh, okay. between uh, high school, university, and living a, a somewhat of a charmed bohemian life. Okay. Um, but then I decided, you know, hey, I better uh, get the career going. And uh, <laughs> got my degree from UVic in political science and geography, which is interesting, but pretty well useless. <laughs> <laughs> no, joking aside. And um, it was interesting. I, I actually, one of my studies was uh, Asian geography. Okay. I was always interested in geography, uh, world maps, uh, you know, cultural people. And uh, at the end of the term, they just said, hey, we'll give you some cash if you go to China. I said, well, hang on, okay. You know, and it wasn't a lot of money, but back then, you know, money is money. A couple thousand dollars goes a long way. Well, wait, Canadian dollars or American dollars? Uh, Canadian dollars. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Anyway, so I, I actually, <laughs> um, politics, politics aside, I ended up in Taiwan. Okay. Um, so I left, uh, I guess it was 2002 early, and I did six, six months in Taiwan. Uh, head down, I was learning Chinese, Mandarin, mm-hmm. Pinyin. My, my Mandarin was actually quite good. Um, but I, I, I hit a wall. I, I realized, you know, with all due respect, I have a lot of Chinese friends, but it, it was not for me mm-hmm. uh, culturally. And I was looking at sort of my future you know, sort of a, a young man's crisis. What am I doing here? And um, I had a good friend, Rob, Rob Kennedy, who a lot of the guys know. Uh, he was living here. Uh, he has an interesting story about he, how, how he landed here. But um, he said, hey, why don't you come over for the weekend? And so I flew over. 
He said he'd recently uh, moved jobs. Uh, he's a journalist. And he moved jobs from uh, a publication known as Business Day that's now defunct. Uh, got me an interview the Monday morning and I got the job, which is essentially editing, mm -hmm. editing local business news. Mm -hmm. And I went back to Taiwan, packed up my stuff and uh, been here ever since. Okay. So it's, it's uh, in some ways a remarkable story, but uh, everything happens for a reason. I would say so. Yeah, I, I think so. Uh, your your story sounds kind of similar to DJ's, actually. Okay. He was in uh, Vietnam, and he came here for the weekend because somebody said you should go at least visit Thailand, and he fell in love with it. Yeah. Went back home, and then came back to Thailand. So. Yeah. Yeah, I'd been here. I uh, was lucky the year I did in Australia. Uh, I have actually family scattered all over the world, which mm -hmm. is another sort of push. For, for me to be uh, outside of Canada. I've got oh, a brother okay. in Hong Kong. I had a, my mom's brother um, was uh, in Hong Kong for 40 years. And on the, the tail end of the Australia trip, we, we hit Phuket. Okay. Uh, I met with them. And as an 18 year old in what year was it? 1994. Yeah. Uh, I was. You were 18 in 94. God, I feel old all <laughs> of a sudden. Jeez. Dude. <clears throat> well, uh, it's all relative. It's dumb. <laughs> But I was uh, bright-eyed and, and bushy-tailed and, and saw uh, an interesting side of, obviously, uh, Thailand and, mm -hmm. you know, decided I liked it. I came back uh, with my brother in 2000 um, on his stag party, and you can imagine with how that went. Um, <laughs> yeah. I've heard lots of stories. About, was it in Phuket? It was. was it in, okay. It was I've in heard Phuket. lots of stories. And, Not as um, crazy as, as Patia, but I've heard And lots. this was the year 2000, and I would argue, um, again, I was younger, I was... Uh, yeah, as I say, everything's, the whole world's a little bit different mm -hmm. uh, when you're that age, but it was a bit, it was a pretty wild time, okay. uh, I would say, uh, 2000. And then I, I moved here two years later. I was in Asia again, and uh, yeah, as I said, you know, why not try Thailand? My uncle had a few connections here uh, that I tried to follow up on, but I, I started as a journalist, mm -hmm. um, and then, uh, you know, I've had a, a wide variety of experiences and careers basically since then so. okay so what is it you do now if you can talk about it i don't know if you can or not so well i don't work for the fbi okay or CSIS, <laughs> so i uh no. um i'm in the software business okay. Okay. uh essentially big data we have a um a uh, com combination of hardware and software technologies we do tracking systems counting systems uh even facial recognition gender identification wow. so so you might actually work with the fbi or you never know, <laughs> uh, but people who know me, sure as hell know I wouldn't qualify there. But um, uh, so yeah, no, I've a uh, software business right now. Uh, I run Southeast Asia or Asia Pacific, but mostly focused in Southeast Asia. Okay. Retail uh, is our main focus, mm -hmm. and retail is is quite big here. Mm -hmm. uh, partly because there's no parks. You know, you ask a, a local what they're going to do on the weekend. Typically, it's they go to the mall. Yeah, you know? absolutely. And then then so. you, when you tell them, like I just recently went to Khao Yai, and they're like, "Oh yeah, yeah, okay." Or uh, we went whale watching one day, and they're yeah. like, they, "Where? What?" I said, "Whale watching? Where's that?" <laughs> Is that outside? No, that was in. Th well, yeah, <laughs> but it was uh, in the. Uh, Bay of Thailand, so it was yeah. awesome. Yeah, I've got some great video. I still have to edit that out. So, but yeah, yeah. yeah. So I've been doing that um, five years. Before that, though, we had an, an interesting run. Um, you know, I, I, back to the, you know, the the journalism. It was basically editing. I moved from Business Day to Deutsche Press, which was in the Bangkok Post building, and that was an interesting gig because we were essentially editing uh, all the Asian stories. So we had okay. stringers in every country and they were sending us the news stories. DPA, you'll find them in the Bangkok Post. It's mm -hmm. the German press and it's the English division. So we had three people on the desk, uh, two were German speaking mm -hmm. and their job was way more intense than mine because they had to translate everything. Uh, and yeah, and yeah. I, I wouldn't say I just hit spell check, but it, <laughs> a lot of what I did was- Spell check, grammar check, done. Uh, with the exception of a few countries where the, the copy coming out was uh, pretty pretty heinous. Okay. Um, so I did that uh, during a very interesting time. That was right during the Iraq War, mm -hmm. which was 2000 and let me get it right, 2003. Okay. Uh, so there was a lot going on and we were doing a lot of features and mm -hmm. I liked it and, and I, I would like to say I, I could have done more, you know, as far as my, you know, the political science degree, you know, you know, it's all you do in universities, you write. So yeah. I, I was 
fairly good, and that's why I think I did okay at that job was um, I can write, but I was restless. You mm -hmm. know, I was sitting behind a, a computer screen. Um, you know, I'm a more of a centric people guy, mm -hmm. and uh, so I got into essentially sales. I met a, another Canadian, um, Scott Crosby, who was doing a telecom business, and he said he needed a guy to work with him, and the business model was, was quite interesting. We were essentially sourcing passive infrastructure. So mm -hmm. if you, you know, what runs your cell phone is a base station, the big towers. Right. All the equipment that goes on there, uh, the towers themselves, the antennas, the transmission, the cable, we were sourcing out of Asia. And for the first time, we were entrepreneurs in selling it to a lot of the big Western companies. So companies like okay. Ericsson, Alcatel, Vodafone, which is our big, uh, big blue whale. Uh, you know, traditionally they'd all made their own equipment. Uh, telecom in the 80s, 90s was high tech, you know, yeah. a lot of, and it was all made, you know, in-house uh, back. But like everything else, everything started to be made in China or made in, in, in Asia. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were sort of pioneers in doing that. So we had a very good run uh, for about five years, uh, 2005 till 10. Uh, we were basically set up in Thailand, we were sourcing some of the equipment uh, out of Thailand, like towers. Steel mm -hmm. is very good here. Okay. Uh, and then a lot of the other equipment was coming out of Beijing. Okay. And uh, we had some, some good clients. Scott was a telecom guy, so he had a lot of the network already, and I was uh, supporting him. But we got onto Vodafone. And, um, you know, Vodafone New Zealand became our, our biggest client, Vodafone Kenya, which was Safaricom. Mm -hmm. And um, so it was a very interesting job. And I got, I was very lucky I got to travel uh, what I call a lot of the fourth world. You okay. know, a lot the of fourth the fourth world. Okay. A lot of the, the developing, uh, very, very developing world, Fiji, uh, Tanzania, Kenya. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, South Africa. And, um, yeah, we had a very good run doing that. Uh, I was traveling probably more than half the time. Um, you know, and he was living in Thailand. I mean, how, how great was that? Yeah. Uh, until uh, Vo uh, Huawei and ZTE. You know, you, you've probably heard of Huawei. Uh, the big Chinese consortiums, the okay. big Chinese companies. They started rising, and their business model was simple. You know, free financing for 10 years. we got the government backing us. We'll send 100 guys, you know, into your country and, and try to compete with that. Yeah, he can <laughs> so very quickly, our, our hardware sales, our, our basically business model, uh, shrunk to uh, services model. And I was faced with essentially relocating, mm -hmm. um, relocating to another country. And, and by that time, my um, bachelor days were, were, were still in effect. But I'd met what at the time was my, uh, my future wife, okay. uh, Yui. And uh, so relocating was, wasn't uh, an attractive option. So uh, I guess I'm babbling on here, but no, that's okay. Don't worry. Um, Don't worry. So yeah, no, I, that's that's where I was looking around for something a little bit more localized. Um, the software business has an IT overlap, mm -hmm. I would say, and um, I liked data. I like the future of data, and it, it is, I think, a forward-thinking uh, a business. Um, you know, data is tied into everything mm -hmm. uh, yeah. these days. So uh, so yeah, I've been doing that since. I guess it's 2011, and uh, so it's been a good run. It's been a very good run. I've been very lucky, I think, to to live in a place like Thailand. I mean, you must love Thailand. Oh, absolutely. How it, many years you've been here? I've been here now 11 years. Okay, 11 so and I, a half. So, so you, you you've uh, can relate to I guess some of what I'm saying. Oh, absolutely. For me, for me, Thailand is is the epitome of East meets West. You know, and I think in some places, especially Bangkok. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Chiang yeah, Mai, not so much, but yeah. You know, th I I think. You know, the, the irony of, of hearing that some people used to get hardship postings, you know, in a place like Thailand, this <laughs> is just paradise. Yeah. But I, I found Taiwan to be that for me. You okay. know, I, I, joking aside, I could go into a supermarket and not identify like one item and, and just think, you know, I was, I was eating at McDonald's, I think, when I was in Taiwan five times a week. You mm -hmm. know, I was, I was really... So you didn't think, take to the local food? Um... To be honest, I, I, I wasn't, my network was not uh, diverse okay. at that time. I was new in Asia. I didn't mm -hmm. know anyone there. Uh, I was teaching to make ends, and, ends meet mm -hmm. and uh, I was studying. You know, as I was saying, I was doing the, the Mandarin. I was studying about well, three hours a day. So I wasn't quite out there. And, and I think, you know, it, it, yeah, I found it, I found it a, a hardship for me you know, mm -hmm. to be there. 
I didn't love the food. You know, I okay. love Chinese food now, and I've sort of grown a palate for it. But, um, um, you know, you come here, and it's, it's very westernized. It's very uh, service-oriented. The ties are obviously very warm. You don't, don't agree? <laughs> I, I, I agree on to a certain level, to a certain point, because mm. I come from um, a customer service background. Okay. And I, I worked in it, worked in the customer service industry for 15 years in various different levels. Most of it become most of it from restaurant, the restaurant industry. Okay. I've done every single job in a restaurant except own it. Okay. 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 And yeah, the, the service with a smile is absolutely there. But if there's something they don't want to do, they'll say, okay. And you'll, that'll be the last you hear of it. Do you know what I mean? Now, don't get me wrong. It, it's come just in the, the short amount of time I've been in Thailand. I've seen huge changes in just in the service industry itself. Like I can remember I'd been in Thailand for maybe six months and I was looking for a pair of bootlaces, yeah. just a pair of bootlaces. And this is like one of my favorite stories. But at the time, I was so furious. Yeah. And I went to MBK because they have so many shops and shoe shops and everything. And it was like, oh, I need laces. And, well, first I'd walk into the, one of the shops and they would look at me, they'd be all happy and they'd say hello. And I was like, yes, I, I'm looking for laces for my boots. And they, they're complete facial structure, every, not stru- facial structure, but their expression would completely change. Like from like from being happy to like, oh. And like, no, we don't have any. I said, okay, well, do you know where I can get some? And they'd be like, oh, over there. Yeah, let me uh, go back. It, it, it's a warm uh, service that they have here. You know, the service with a smile, um, you know, the high-end service is obviously very attractive for, you know, this is one thing about Thailand that I, I've, you know, as I said, I'm fairly well-traveled. Mm-hmm. Um, I've, I've seen a lot of different uh, cultures and I've never been anywhere in the world where every other culture in the world is, is, is here and they love it. They, mm-hmm. they really are happy to be here. We're talking about Everyone from Africans to Europeans to North Americans, South Americans, mm-hmm. you name it, Australians. Um, they like it here. It's, it's, it's got a good buzz. But on the service side, I agree with you. It, it has a lot to be desired. I mean, it's come a long way. Yeah. I mean, there's a few restaurants that I've, that I've been to or a few places, a few stores that I've yeah. been to where the, the customer service is, has come, come leaps and bounds from what it was just 11 yeah. years ago. But yeah. Yeah, and and uh, but don't you find that it's it's a uh, tropical phenomenon, with the exception, I would say, of maybe Hong Kong and, and Singapore, which are very different city states in their own right. Where it's hotter in the world, I think you get a lot of trends that way. That people quite are, possibly. I mean, people are sleepy during the day. Yeah, <laughs> you know, like I mean, they, outside of like visiting Canada, like in the winters and in the summers. And going once to Tijuana, Mexico, which may as well not be across the border. Yeah. Um, I'd never actually been outside of the United really? States until I came to Thailand. Wow. Okay. So I, I, I'd always wanted to, like, I want to visit Japan. I still want to, I haven't visited there yet, but I want to visit Japan. I'd never been to Singapore. I'd never been to, I wanted to yeah, visit yeah. Cambodia. I'd wanted to visit Thailand. I wanted to visit countries in Europe. And it was just one of those things. I always said I was going to do it, but I never actually got the opportunity. Uh, I was in the Navy, and I was a bit of a troublemaker, so I spent a lot of time <laughs> just going around in circles in the water and then coming back, and then I'd get in trouble for something stupid. And so I never really got yep. to see other countries outside of that. So I would have thought the Navy would have taken you. Uh, I guess that's what I don't know about the, the Army or the, you know, the, the military, but wouldn't you have... Uh, yes, if you wouldn't have been a trouble, if you wouldn't have been a troublemaker like I was. The, I see. I, I got in on, I went in under a program that is now defunct. They no longer have it because I've actually looked all this stuff up again. Um, I went in under what's called the SAFE program, which is a submarine advanced electronics field. Yeah. And that was great. I went through boot camp. After, at the end of my boot camp, they put us, they had to do a, a psychological evaluation to see if we were crazy or not. They put you in a little room and they, they close the door and make it sound like they lock it. I don't know if they actually lock the door or not, but they let you sit in there for a few minutes. There's no clocks. It's, you're just in this little square room. And then somebody comes in and sits in front of you and asks you a bunch of what I felt was very stupid questions to find out if you flip out on them. Um, like, have you ever thought of killing anybody? Would you ever kill anybody? You know, and it's like... 
Well, any human being has thought about it, but whether you follow through on it or not is a, a completely different story, you know. And they thought my answers were good enough. I got into the submarine field. I went into basic enlisted submarine school, which they ba- teach you basics about submarines. I went into uh, basic electronics rate training, which is exactly what it says, ele- yeah, basic yeah. basic electronics training. Um, then I got my field, which was radium in field. I went to radium in A school, radium in unique school, radium in C school. Throughout this, I got in trouble a few times just for stupid things. Find trouble. Uh, I've been to <laughs> Captain's Mess. Oh yeah, absolutely. I, I'm not. A, I'm not ashamed of it at all. I mean, it started off. A friend of mine, uh, his room was inspected and it failed, and they were going to reinspect his room. And he had a few beers in his locker, mm. um, and he was underage. And we were also in the barracks that we were in. Whether you were of age or not, you weren't allowed to have beer in your room. And he said, man, I'm going to be inspected on Saturday. You know, and this was on Friday. He said, I'm going to be inspected tomorrow. Can you hold my beers? And I'll pick uh, them up on Sunday. i this story before. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, sure, not a problem. I, so I, I, two cans of beer, the type of beer I don't even like. So I said, yeah, sure, no problem. So I, I took them, I put them in my locker. His room got inspected on Saturday. We didn't meet up on Sunday. We didn't see each other, you know, just two different lives, you know. Uh, Monday morning, they say, okay, we're doing a complete barracks, in- barracks inspection. Everybody, let's go. And I've got two cans of beer sitting in my locker. I'm like, Phew. Now, he was a friend of mine, so obviously I'm not going to drop the ball and, and get him in trouble. You not rat on your friends, eh? Absolutely not. Absolutely <laughs> not. You know, and they, the, I ended up going to captain's mass. You know, I was underage. They we are like, how'd you get the beer? I said, I stood outside of a, a liquor store and asked somebody to buy it for me. And they did. Yeah. <laughs> and they're like, Okay. But the nice thing was, although it started the downward progression for me of, of eventually being... You were, you were flagged, right? Yeah, I was pretty much flagged because also at the same time, they decided they were going to start downgrading, downsizing the military. So they were looking for people who were troublemakers. Yeah, this guy's a criminal. Yeah, yeah. Pretty so much. You're yeah. basically like Tim Robbins in the Shawshank Redemption. Eh? G- totally innocent. And, uh, oh, I won't say I was totally innocent. Not only that, innocent. it was probably warm beer that you didn't even like. Yeah, well, I didn't drink it. I didn't touch it. But the, <laughs> oh, the good geez, thing the was... The story gets worse. The good thing was is the guy, as a friend, he the money that the military took from me, he paid me back. Yeah. So that was the one good side of it. And he thanked me for, for profusely for not getting him into trouble as well. And I could have very easily done that, yeah. but... You don't turn on your friends. Do you no. know what I mean? I've, I've always been a believer of that. So I agreed. Agreed. Uh, loyalty is, is a very important uh, mm. quality. Definitely. And it just, that kind of led to other things and led to other things and led to other things. And eventually then they, they said, well, okay, you can't be a radio man because you're a bit of a troublemaker. Well, I'm going to make you a cook. I said, that's fine. I, okay. I, I enjoy cooking. Uh, I went to San Diego for three months. Um, I'd, at this time, I'd been in the military for or in the Navy for almost three years. Mm-hmm. I was supposed to be on a six-year program. Um, I came back, and I, I had gotten in trouble for something I hadn't done, but the captain didn't want to listen to me, and they yeah. said, okay, you're done. I was like, that's fine. I'm, I don't care anymore. Yeah, no, it's, it's so. a fascinating story, but... Um I can honestly say, uh, yeah, it would be tough, tough, tough sled. I, I admire people that are that are in the military and what they what they've done. Uh, little, did you ever get into a submarine? Yeah, I mean, yeah, oh yeah. I bet. So I you're, been, you're coastal, and you're. I was coastal. I done. I went out once for a few days where we just went out and did circles in the water, and then came back just doing a test run. I've painted submarines. Do you know what I mean? You yep. know, the insides and stuff like that. The, the worst part was, and fortunately, I grew up on water, you know, I mean, being in Minnesota, land of 10,000 lakes, I was always going out on boats and stuff like that. We came up in the middle of a, a quite wavy weather, yep. and a submarine is a round bottom boat. So you imagine the boats go like, they kind of have this big rocking motion, and they put all of the, what they call them nubs. Because non-useful bodies. Now, they're not allowed to call them that anymore. But Non-useful bodies? Yeah. Nubs? Well, they call That's them nubs, anyway. yeah. So they're not <laughs> yeah, allowed to call that them that anymore. That's yeah. a good one, yeah. So they brought them all onto the mess deck, and they have the big juice containers with what we call as bug juices, essentially high-potent Kool-Aid, yeah. in these big tanks that you see everywhere. And we're up on the, in, this, in these big swells, and the boat's going from side to side, and you're watching the, these juice tanks just sloshing back. And... Half of the guys are sitting there going, and I'm sitting there going, yeah, uh, can I get something to eat while I'm here? <laughs> but Yeah, submarine, uh, oof, not for me. You know, I'm, I'm uh, 
quite confident in, in a lot of areas, but uh, heights and tight spaces, forget it. Yeah, yeah. that was that's. I think that's why they put us in that little tiny room and had somebody. Yeah. Uh, I heard now it, they could have been just testing me, but when they they there was a group of us that were going into into the submarine program, and one person ended up not being allowed in because he he went nuts. But whether this was him or if they were just playing an audio, I could hear somebody outside of the room freaking out, going, let me out of here, let me out, I can't stand me. Whether it was him or not, I don't know. It was just somebody, I could hear somebody panicking and screaming. And I was just like, dude's freaking out. Take care well, of him. I guess uh, you've seen Das Boot. Yes. One of the, the better movies uh, in, in my time. Uh, that was enough. <laughs> <laughs> I know it was a very great movie, historical movie, but that was enough for me. And um uh, I think I would have been more of the, the pilot type, you know, okay. the, the Air Force type. But, yeah, uh, I'm anyway, it's interesting uh, how, <laughs> you know, different people end up, you know, in Thailand. Mm. And, uh, and I'm sure you've seen it through the hockey guys. And, you know, from my side, 15 years, I'm, I'm one of the, uh, I guess it's a weird word for me now, the elder statesmen. Uh, and I've seen a lot of people come, a lot of people go, and mm. they all have different stories and different backgrounds. Yeah. Uh, many are North American, but you, you get the odd... European, you know, Russian, even we've had a, f it was an African fellow, I can't remember, I can't remember his name, Scotty, Scotty Murray would know him, but okay. uh, we even had a, an African guy from Kenya that was playing with us, wow. but they're all coming from different, um, different backgrounds, different stories, and it's always interesting to, to, to know where, where people, because, hmm. uh, you know, that's the one thing about Thailand, and I still believe this very strongly today, uh, other than other markets in, in Asia, or other expat communities, mm -hmm is people really engineer themselves to be here. Uh, uh, it's less likely that they're, they're posted here. And if they're posted here a, a long time, it's, it's typically rare. You know, a company will move them to somewhere else, yeah. et cetera. But, so and the point is a lot of people want to be here and it makes a very uh, interesting, uh, I would say community, uh, expat community of, of people. And my um, theory, my, um, thing I, I've, I've realized there's, there's there's two benchmarks for people here and it, okay. uh, I'll tell you one thing Bangkok is a, is a behemoth of a city it's not for everyone mm -hmm. um, but some people have a difficult time to make it to two years okay um, and then it's the five-year mark it's tough to leave after that so there's those are the two yeah uh, prior to the five-year mark there was a point in time where I was pretty much done with Thailand <laughs> I had a bad job uh, that started. I think that's where it started with. Um, I was kind of screwed over by the employer, mm. um, and it just. I, I kind of held on to it for a lot longer than I really needed to. Um, but then, one day, I just woke up and was like, "That's crazy," you know. And the house isn't gonna fall down. No, 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 no. But uh, I think everyone's had. Uh, stories. You know, yeah. Everyone's had difficulties. Uh, oh yeah. Absolutely. You know, it's 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 Bangkok essentially is is an assault mm. on the senses. You know, yeah. sight, sound, taste, everything. It's it's like overload. Yeah. Well, um, it's like any major metropolitan city. I don't know if you had any of those where you were where you're from. I mean, I yep. very often used to go to Minneapolis, St. Paul. Yep. If it's not something that you, I mean, I grew up in the suburbs. Don't get me wrong, but going into Minneapolis, St. Paul, it is a huge assault on the senses if you're not not yep. used to it it's not quite yep. what bangkok is but it is a major me they're both major metropolitan cities yep. but i also used to go to like rosa which like it's a it, yes it is the county seat of its county yeah but their population is like 2000 people so it's like tiny it's relative and, yeah. and uh, you know i i as i say vancouver island victoria is a couple hundred thousand people mm -hmm. and and uh, you know coming to a place like this it was just awesome you yeah. know like when i was I think I was 26 when I moved here, which was a good age, mm -hmm. I'll have to say. Um, yeah, I mean, it was just overload, and it was exactly, I think, what I was looking for. Uh, you know, I dived in the deep end, and mm -hmm. uh, I would say I'm still here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> probably, uh, I love it Probably, now, so. uh, s you know, stayed a little bit too long, but no, I'm very, uh, I have a wonderful wife, mm -hmm. and uh, as you know, I've got a, a young young son now, and uh, he's, he's he's fantastic, so it's it's been a... It's been a, a fascinating, um, it, it's, it's gone beyond a chapter for me. It's okay. been basically half, half of my known life. Yeah. Because I don't count the, the toddler years as basically, you know, you're living, breathing. That, my wife is almost like, is pretty much the same. She's been here for 20 years. So. Wow. 
yeah, yeah. so that's uh, you know it's 15 years yeah that's 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 a good stretch but um, as I said you know after five years you're settled you're, mm-hmm. you're comfortable everyone's got their own niche mm-hmm. and there is a comfort there's a warm level that you appreciate about yeah. living here uh, the food is very good oh. the people are very warm the weather is it's hot but it's it's nice you we know? have like right now it's kind of cooled off with late cool season but yeah this is cool i mean i was just back in canada and it's cold <laughs> i mean I, I i i appreciate it but it was it was very cold this winter so um well, I'm, I'm going back to the states in april to see my kids so excellent. It, it's usually excellent. cooler um well, Minnesota, yeah. No, I'm not going to Minnesota this oh, time. I'm going sorry. to Pennsylvania. My kids live ah, in Pennsylvania. So excellent. I'd love to for them to see Minnesota, but um, okay. they've been there. My daughter's been there twice when she was, like, yeah. too young to even remember. And the same with my son. He's been there once, too young to remember. So, Okay. But, yeah, yeah it's... it's. Uh, I'd also love for them to come here, absolutely. So. Yeah, yeah. No, it's a special... Uh, it's a unique city. And, and mm-hmm. yeah, a lot of... I hear a lot of comparisons. It's just another big Asian city. Arguably yes, but um, I, I think it's it's got a very special character. Big Asian cities. I've only been to two, really. Yep. I've been to Bangkok and Singapore. Okay. Yes, they're similar, but they are so vastly different. Oh, well, Singapore is a utopia. Singapore is uh, out of a movie. It's yeah. a Truman Show there. Right? Yeah. It's, it's um, but um, and that's that's why it's so nice to go there. You go there, everything's sort of boulevards and yeah sidewalks and you know people stop when you cross the road it's yeah it's, exactly uh, it's, yeah but um so i don't mean to to push on here cause no, we kind of we we went been, on but you did bring up hockey when did you start playing hockey i started when i was uh old enough to skate so about six years old i have an older brother mm-hmm. um and when you know he's he's about six years older as a younger brother i think in any context um he's he's the rock star you know he's okay. he was i followed him into everything that's why i did tree planting. i'm the older brother in my family so <laughs> well it's, I suppose it's all debatable if that's a good thing but um so i followed him uh, into everything we're very different characters in okay. some ways um but um you know in sports i did everything that he did um, and you know, he, he came out to Asia when he was 24 and it's probably no a fluke that I did, uh, you know, the same thing. So, but he, he was into hockey. My mother who's Scottish, um, my father's, uh, Canadian, but she wasn't super excited about, uh, us playing hockey because of the, you know, injuries and, and potential injuries of that. But, uh, no, so six, six years old, I got into peewee, I guess it was, then it's, uh, was it Bantam and can't even remember the divisions, but um, Pee Wee's Phantom, Midgets. Midgets, that's right. Varsity, Junior Varsity, Varsity, Juniors. Yeah. If yeah. you don't go into the, I don't know if that what they have high school hockey in Canada, but. Well, they do in, in Canada, but it's just this thing. In Victoria, they don't. Okay. Uh, partly, you know, and, and it's one thing, you know, a lot of, you go to Ontario and it's high school hockey and mm. whatever. In the West Coast, it was more high school rugby and, okay. and outdoor soccer, these kind of sports. We didn't really have high school hockey, but uh, I played in the, the sort of intramural leagues. I never played actually at a very high level, even though I've modestly been a, a, one of the better players out here over the years. Uh, I always played in the house levels, you know, where okay. uh, partly because I had a lot of other interests. You know, I was never the guy... You got to be super dedicated. The five thirty a.m. practices, <laughs> yes. you know, traveling, uh, which is some of that thing. helped with my dad being the coach. So, <laughs> well, there you go. Um, but I, I played um, quite a bit of hockey, you know. Uh, but I also played soccer. I also played uh, baseball. I played mm-hmm. go- basically everything except basketball. Basketball, okay. I did not like, you know. But uh, um, but I, you know, interestingly, I, I probably played more hockey since I've been in Thailand than I ever did in Canada. Oh, and wow. It's, okay. Yeah, it's great bunch of guys, great community. And, mm-hmm. and I think there's a, uh, you know, when you're in a place such as Asia or such as Bangkok, um, it's a cultural attachment, you mm-hmm. know, like it's a, it's a piece of home that you, you need to grab onto. And yeah. I think for a lot of guys, it becomes a passion that way and it becomes something that, that it's a real important well, part of their lives here. Watching you guys, I'll be totally honest, watching <laughs> you guys play has reminded me of what I loved about hockey. My last two years of playing ice hockey, I wa- there was no love there anymore. Um, and I think a lot of that had to do was with the fact that um, 
my dad and I didn't see eye to eye on a lot of things when it came to hockey. Um, I also had two coaches that complete opposite types of people between myself and those coaches and we just constantly butted heads and it just it stopped becoming fun and I'm the type of person when it's not fun anymore yep. I'm not going to do it 100% you know I, I agree with you um, it's part of my mantra in, in life is if it's not fun don't do it mm. and uh, I suppose that's part of it you know I, I, I was never that fundamentally serious about it. Uh, I enjoyed the game. I think it's the best game. With all due respect, the only other sport I can say has the same team team element as as hockey is rugby. Okay. Um, you know, where, where you know, you dig deep and you you know, it's it's obviously a physically demanding game, mm-hmm. but um, it's the best best game in the, in the world. Um, I, you know, I'm I, relearning that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. As, you got to get out there. You got to get Well, get, that's what I'm I'm yeah. going when I go back, I plan on getting a pair of skates. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then when I come back here, I'm going to get some equipment and I'm not, I'm going to play on the the shinny hockey yeah. on Thursday, so Absolutely. Yeah. If if I feel my legs are back up to that level of of yeah. hockey, we'll see what happens when I come back, but Yeah. So, um yeah, I, I mean, I, I got into hockey here uh, very early because mm-hmm. Rob Kennedy, the guy I knew, was already playing uh, with the Flying Farangs. And when I got here, there was no uh, Rama 9 rink. Mm-hmm. Um, Samrong, which was another rink, was it, we, we were playing in uh, Lad Prow. Have you ever seen the rink out at Lad Prow? No, it's, I haven't. It's basically a, a shoebox sauna. I mean, it's in, and we were playing, I kid you not, at 8, I think it was 8.30 on Sunday mornings and uh, the turnout was for that time of you know whether you got a family or not the turnout was was impressive mm-hmm. um, and I, 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 I tell you I used to literally go from the nightclub grab my you know, <laughs> hockey bag <laughs> and then, you know, then this is the passion you know this is this is how hardcore you know the the jokes about Canadians and hockey well it's it's a reason for it you mm-hmm. know and we were all showing up at the rink, 8.30, and that was the only ice that we had. And the rink is tiny, uh-huh. and the fog, and the sweat, and... Uh, but those are the old days. Then we had um, Central World. Okay. Back in the old day, it had a, an ice rink. And what they didn't have for many years was the boards. So, in I think it was 2002 or 2003, um, a lot of the guys, the expats, we, we financed, we funded... Uh, the actual board. Everyone oh. bought like one piece of the board okay. or whatever, and, and they created a rink. Uh, we had a league. St- Scott Whitcomb started the first Thai World Hockey League season then. I think it was 2003. And um, then, you know, the tsunami hit. We had a big tsunami game, a lot of press. You could probably even look it up on okay. the news. That was a, a great event. And then within, uh, I think, a month after that, they, they shut it down. They basically said they were going to renovate the mall, which they've obviously done. Yeah, twice. And, yeah. Yeah. and uh, we were off to Samron. Have you been out to Samron? No, I haven't. I, there is a guy in the league. And I don't know his name, but uh, he generally when he substitute, he plays for the aware, kind of a bigger guy, blondish hair. Uh, um, aware, aware. Oh, uh, um, Peter. Yeah. Possibly. Uh, but he's a substitute. I think I worked with him at Elite a few times and because I, I remember talking to somebody about hockey and okay. it, he looks very similar to this guy. Okay. Uh, Elite Training Institute, which was a language school that I believe they're still around. They just have moved locations. Um, and he was like, yeah, yeah, you should come out. And I, I, I never did, obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah. Well, Samrong was um, a fascinating uh, play. Have you ever been out to Samrong or Samut Prakan in that area? It, I, it I've is, been to Megabangna. But it's the, the Flint, Michigan of, of Thailand. I mean, with all due respect, um, you know, it, it's, it's the uh, industry area. Okay. And it's um, a little bit different than, say, Sukhumvit. Okay. And that, we got this... You know, all of a sudden we're out there with our hockey sticks and mm-hmm. our hockey bags, uh, and they have an Olympic-sized rink out there. Okay, still do. Yep. Okay. And uh, the lighting's not good. It's it's sort of like you know it's a bit dark, a bit dim. But uh, we played out there for six years. We had six years of leagues and um, this probably is with the, the best World Hockey League. Yeah, okay. this, uh, Scott Whitcomb's league. Um, probably six years, and I, I always joke that I I spent some of my peak years hanging out in Samrong <laughs> after the games, you know, hitting the 7-Elevens. And, but a great group of guys. And, and that was probably the best stretch uh, of hockey I've ever played. You know, we would get the rink, you know, Olympic-sized rink for two mm-hmm. hours, uh, you know, a night. And, and, you know, you just skate, skate, skate. I've never been in 
such good shape as I was uh, back then. But, um, you know, twice a week going out there, you know, managing the traffic mm -hmm. and everything. And, um, and then, uh, yeah, basically they, they developed a new rink in Rama 9, which is where we are now. And I think that was, now it's got to be almost five years ago, 2012. Okay. Um, which is better. It's better for uh, exposure. It's better for uh, location, getting mm -hmm. there. You know, I, you live, you and I live basically two blocks away. Yeah. So, so it's been good, but you know, we, we still go out to Samrong, uh, once a year for the, uh, the Din Dang Jets celebrity game. We have from our first year in the league, we, we didn't have sponsors. Okay. So we had, uh, locales of, of Bangkok. My team was the Din Dang Jets. We had the Sukhumvit Stars. Uh, let me think. What was the other one? And the um, Klong Toy Whalers, and, and that was Scotty Murray's team. And we still have an annual classic game. Uh, okay. We go out to the, the the old rink in Samrong, and it's it's a lot of fun for the guys. You sh definitely this year you'll come out, and, and you should uh, you should do a show out there. But so it's been a lot of hockey, and and um, it's been great, you know, because you know a place like this, you you need. You need a piece of home. Mm -hmm. You know, you need is something uh, for a lot of Europeans. That's playing football. For mm -hmm. a lot of, say, Aussies, New Zealanders, it's playing rugby. You need you need that piece of culture. And I think for Canadians, it's obviously hockey. If it's not on the ice, we even have uh, ball hockey down at the British Club. Okay, uh, uh, in Siloam. Yep, British Club, and they've they've actually got a court with with boards and, and wow. nets. So it's a, it's actually kind of an arena. Okay, even got a scoreboard up there. Cool. And, uh, so I play uh, down there as well, um, you know. And, and it, for me, it's it's exercise, it's fun, mm -hmm. but it's 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 cultural and it's it's special that way. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So how did you get involved with it? I mean, how did you get involved with like Scotty and and uh, Scott Wickham and Murray and the Thai World Hockey League and the Flying Frogs? Yeah, I I mean, I how was, did that happen? Uh, you know, back in the day, I was as I was saying, going out twice a week. Uh, I was a captain of a team. Um, I was introduced through through Rob Kennedy, but Scotty Murray. Who, who uh, who's been here? I think probably 25 years now. He's he's like the godfather of hockey, and and so he's tied into everything. Um, and then Scotty Whitcomb came along and, and developed the league and, and made it into. Uh, it was quite special, you know. It was mm -hmm. quite fun for many years, and uh, you know, as things evolve, I, I think uh, it's good to have a, a new sheriff at times. Scotty's busy with his with his business mm -hmm. and his family. And now we have the Siam Hockey Hockey League, and um, and honestly, I'm I'm playing uh, much less now, not because I'm just old, but being a family man, and and uh, you know, as time time is 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 everything right yeah. now for me. So, but uh, yeah, and 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 I'd say, how did I? Why did I get so involved? It's the people. You know, okay. the people have been uh, very good. Uh, they love the game. And um, you know it's 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 a it's a highlight of your week. I hate to say it, you know. You no, I can, your work I can absolutely understand yeah. that. I mean, don't get me wrong. I love what I do for my job. I love podcasting, but just going out and spending that time with the rink with you guys, talking to you, interviewing you guys after the game, I, I absolutely do love it. I mean, every, you can still see the passion in the hockey in, in those guys. So. Yeah, and you know Johnny Oduya, right? Mm -hmm. Johnny Oduya, uh, this is a great chapter. He um, they had a lockout in the National Hockey League. I guess it was 2013, mm -hmm. and uh, so Johnny, who's Swedish, Swedish Kenyan, um, I think he was in touch with a few of the Swedish guys. Um, all of a sudden, was coming out to to Thailand, and he was bringing his gear. He, I guess, he'd done some research. We had a rink, so the guys said, "Hey, you know, we've got a." an organization we got a group of guys and not only that we got a tournament coming up do you want to play and and you know awesome at it he's like yeah you know awesome cool. i'm in so johnny adia shows up and I, I will never forget the night where we're out at samrong and there's like 30 of us guys all like you know, nhl guys here and he's trying to do drills on the whiteboard and and what was you know the, the point of the, johnny found himself in, 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 in a place where the game was so simplified again. He's been playing in North America. Mm -hmm. he's, he's a, he's a stay-at-home defenseman. He's been working his way up through the ladder. And all of a sudden, he comes here, this crazy part of the world, the tropics, and he's a rock star. He's an <laughs> all-star. And so we, we had a couple nights with him, and we had him outside at Samrong 7-Eleven, he's kind of looking around like, what, you know, what, what's going on here? But, you know, he's slowly kind of warming up to, hey, this is 
kind of fun. You know, uh-huh. it's, just, it's just like back to the the roots, you know, ground uh-huh. roots of why we're playing again. It's not about making the team. It's not about keeping my job. It's not about, you know, like worrying about anything. It's just fun all of a sudden. And he played in the tournament. Uh, this is the 2012 or t- is it 2013. Played in the tournament um, with us, the Flying Franks, uh, on defense. And we put together our, our best team. I was one of the lines with a lot of the local guys and and you know the funny part is we almost you know he was obviously a huge element on our team and he was yeah. he was awesome out there but we almost got knocked out in the preliminary round we lost <laughs> we lost to the beijing ducks i think it was it was one of those remarkable fluke games where you know it was the shots were like 50 to 10 Jeez. yet they won three to two and and you know we're after the game he, johnny's like you know that's that's hockey this stuff happens and you just got to win the next game, and we did. I think we beat Singapore, and then we, we moved on, and, and he, he progressively got more into mm-hmm. the tournament. We ended up winning it. And uh, there's a lot of stories that will come out from, from that tournament and the, the parties after. But um, remarkably, you know, he, I think he said to me, you know, like, this is, this is the first time I've really been the star. You know, he's never been... The, the the MVP of anything, mm-hmm. and I kid you not, he goes back to the Chicago Blackhawks and they win the Stanley Cup that year. I, I don't know if it's a fluke or whatever, but uh, he won another cup two years later. They should have won another cup if it wasn't for a fluke goal and uh, off the LA Kings. Uh, I remember that series. I remember that series because I I bet money on the on the Blackhawks to win that year, but they should have won three in a row. It's probably because you bet money on the Blackhawks they lost. With my luck, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's the story of my life. Um, and now he's he's obviously uh, with Dallas, um, you know, making it making it large. But his, I would argue, you know, just just from my side, that his career uh, just went, you know, since he came out. He's been out here in the summer um, a couple times since. You know, he's got a connection. He he's he's obviously training a lot of the time. He comes out here, mm-hmm. but it was something special. In fact, I tried to lobby. A few of us tried to lobby when they won the cup. You know, they can take the cup for a day anywhere, anywhere. they want. Yeah. And a lot of guys obviously take it home. We tried to lobby him to bring it to Thailand. And I said, you know, I, I even contacted the CBC News and, and said, you know, if we can get him out here, you've got to do a story. This is a yeah. great story. It's already a great story. Yeah. And it did make, you know, publication. It did make the news in, in North America. You know, Johnny Dewey in Thailand you know, made a lot of the blogs and... I, I remember hearing a lot of his teammates um, when the Blackhawks, you know, s- sort of on the side said, dude, what were you doing out there? You know, like Thailand and whatever. <laughs> and, you know, no one, no one had any idea. Oh, but absolutely not. So it got, it got a lot of good press for him. And, and I think, you know, now he's, he's kind of uh, an ambassador. You know, he awesome. comes out, he does clinics uh, with the kids, and, you know, they all love him. They all mm-hmm. have the, uh, the, the photos with him. And uh, he's, he's a great dude, great dude. But it was a great... Uh, chapter and um, you know it got the publicity I think it, it deserved. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay, have, do you play for like the Bangkok Ice Hockey League also? I did. I did. You I did? got I got <laughs> wooed um, through John. Okay, uh, John uh, uh I, I did. I played with the ties last year. I actually took a year or two off, um, being a you know the honorable family man. <laughs> um, from the Thai World Hockey League, um, partly to work issues and whatever. Uh, but then I started to play again with the Bangkok Hockey League, which is okay. predominantly a Thai league. Yep. And then they pepper and salt a few of us in uh, as, as Westerners. And I think the idea is we do bring a different element. You know, we grew up not only playing the game, but watching the game, living and breathing the game. Mm-hmm. And a lot of the Thais, you know, I give them credit, they're phenomenal athletes. You know, they, they, they're, they're so fit. They're actually built very well for the game. Mm-hmm. But I think the big difference is they haven't watched the game as much as we have. They, right. they, it's, well, it's, it's, to be honest, I mean, even the, the, the Thai people I know, when I tell them I'm going to the rink to watch hockey on Sunday nights, yeah. they're going, you're going to do what? <laughs> watch hockey. There's no hockey in Thailand. Yeah. Yes, there is. Yeah, so. yeah, there is. Yeah. They... Um, They've, you know, I've seen it in 15 years. Even some of the best Thai players, Tor and Moo mm-hmm. and uh, B, and you know, their development has been awesome. And I, I would say partly because they've been playing with, um, you know, us Westerners. Mm-hmm. And the key with hockey and, and with a lot of sports, it's it's 
it's where to go and what to do where the puck isn't you know it's, yeah. it's skating to where the puck will be not to where the puck is yeah and i think the ties are very skilled they're very talented with the puck and, and one-on-one they can do circles around me for example but it's it's their play away from the puck that where they can improve by playing with us so we've uh, back to the bangkok hockey league i played with them um i think the team's structure you know like as far as um uh, parody, you know, we, we it still has a long way to go. I mean, mm-hmm. we, we ended up winning the t- uh, the, the the trophy. You, uh, play te- for, you play for the Thunder then? Thunder. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I played for the Thunder. Um, we, we were top heavy, you know, we were pretty stacked, I have to say. But, you know, at the end of the day, I think it's, it's just good that this league does exist. I think mm-hmm. it's good that they have uh, Westerners involved. And, you know, they still run the show. It's their league. Mm-hmm. But we, we, we do bring a different element into the game. So it was fun. And uh, I guess I guess the league must be starting up again soon. Uh, I don't yeah, know if I haven't got the, the call SHL. yet. Or maybe okay. I'm not on the team anymore. But uh, <laughs> I still got the, the, the uniform and the jersey. And, uh, yeah, John plays with me. Uh, Christian, who uh-huh. we've interviewed as well. He's, he's part of the team. And Henrik, his brother. So, uh, yeah, I look forward to it. And, and um, you know, the development of the game, and including you know, yourself, uh, bringing a, a different angle with, with uh, the blogs and the vlogs, I think it's great. It's great for publicity, and it, it's great for growing the game. I think the potential of hockey in Asia is we're just, you know, at the bottom of the curve. Yeah, know? and it's, it is growing. For every, and everybody I've talked to, they're saying they've, they've seen, just in the, the short time they've been playing with them, the vast improvement in, in the Thai players and with ev- because of everybody being involved. So. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, it's, a, uh, it's a young man's game, but it's, it's, it's developed, evolved into a, a uh, you, know, you look at a guy like Johnny Aduya. Mm-hmm. He's not the typical defenseman that you get from the 80s, which was a 220-pound gorilla. You know? Yeah. He's basically a uh, you know, yoga guy, super... Super fast, super small, and, and that's the future of the game. And what do you have in Asia? Well, that's, that's exactly. the common denominator. And, and, you know, a team like Team Japan, and we watch China, Korea, you know, they're scoring goals against Team Canada and Team USA. I mean, mm-hmm. they're, they're, they're really formidable teams now. Thailand's got a ways to go, and I think, you know, the, the access to uh, equipment is, is a big one. It's expensive. Oh, it's hugely expensive. Hugely expensive. Um, I mean, and then I, ice, look, I looked at skates here. For my size, they only had uh, secondhand skates or used skates, is what we say in America. Um, and they wanted to charge me the same price as brand new skates. <laughs> I was like, nah, it's all right. Welcome to Asia. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I was involved recently with, um, with Zach. I don't know if you met Zach on the Titanium team. He teaches kids on Saturday morning, and I was, okay. I was, uh, was, was involved with that for several months. So there is programs going on. I mean, it's come a long way from the okay. Samrong days, from the Lad Prow days. It's come a long way, and uh, you're getting more kids involved, more, and they, they love the game. They're, awesome. A lot of them are fascinated to see ice, you know. Yeah. Ooh, wow, Nam, Nam Kang, you know. But they love the game. It's fast. It's interesting. And, and you know, everyone loves soccer here, but mm-hmm. I, I think there's a lot of potential. Okay. Yeah. So um, how did you get involved with the SHL? Uh, I guess I got the call. Uh, no, I heard that. Listen, I heard that John and Christian, who I know very well, mm-hmm. uh, were were putting it together with Scotty Murray and I, I, the whole list, uh, um, Pratch and and Rob Taylor, and I, I probably forgetting another guy. You probably know them and yourself, but uh, I heard they were putting something together new. I th- there was no league last year, right. and I think guys were chomping at the bit a bit uh, to get back on. I mean, I don't have as much time, and and uh, but I still love the game. And arguably, uh, I need it for a, a fitness angle as well. <laughs> if you don't, if you stop, there's hockey shape, and then there's basically being fat. <laughs> that, I tell you, that's what happened to me when I quit playing hockey. Yeah. I I went from 199 pounds, nine percent body fat, to 200 pounds, 12 percent body fat, 15 percent. You know, I just kept getting bigger and bigger. And then when I lived in Chiang Mai, I actually got up to 260 pounds. It's huge, wow. yeah. And then I, I came back to Bank. We came back to Bangkok. I got into yoga, back into yoga, um, yep. and I got down to two hundred and twenty five pounds. Okay. And then I got back into karate, um, and I got down to one hundred and ninety pounds. 
Yeah. Um, and now I'm about 205. So, um, but just I, karate, I, I, with karate, I had suffered a few injuries. Plus, I decided I, I needed to take a break because I wanted to focus with what was going on with the SHL. I yep. couldn't handle both of them at the same time, giving 100%. So, I just... Yeah, you know, I I, uh, listen, I just turned forty. Uh, that's that's end. nothing, man. It's nothing. I know. I, know, I, I, we, I just maybe we won't go there, so. but um, the metabolism's not the same. Yeah. yeah, as I said, I took a year off, and yeah, the body reacted uh, negatively to that. Yeah, but um, so I, you know, and this is argument at home. Oh, you know, I got to keep playing. Got to keep fit. You know, babe. You know. You're not gonna like me the other way, so uh, <laughs> it's one of the one of the arguments. We all know that story. I like had to get out the door, but um, so yeah, they put the SHL together. It's it's still early days, but uh, it's it feels fresh. Mm -hmm. It's exciting. Um, you know, the, it's 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 run corporately. You know, guys like Christian and, and John have brought a, a a different element, and obviously yourself with the video, the interviews. I think guys really take take well to that. The Facebook uh, social media angle mm -hmm. has been great, and uh, it's fun. Um, you know, we've had an issue with uh, the Thai uh, national team players, so um, you know, there's been a few challenges along the way. But uh, but it's a new team. You're gonna, I mean, not a new team. It's it's a new league, and you're gonna have these. Do you know what I mean? Growing pains. Exactly. You know, guys are gonna hurt guys are going to get uh, sent mm -hmm. away or they're going to go home and it, it's 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 part of uh you know event management yeah. um, someone's always going to complain but you just roll with it and, and and they've done a very good job and it's 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 refreshing you know as i say i've i've been here a long time i've, I've seen uh, a, a lot of different guys a lot of different leagues uh, not different leagues but different years playing mm -hmm. and it, it you know it feels fresh and and uh, i give credit to scott wickholm who uh, you know worked tirelessly for I think it was over ten years, putting that league together, uh, keeping it going, putting mm -hmm. up with the personalities, the complaints, um, and everything. And and uh, you know I think everyone learns from that. Uh, John and Christian had played in those leagues as well, and uh, and you know, obviously Scotty Murray. And and mm -hmm. um, you know they're 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 we're all wiser for it. You know that's. The way it is excellent so, uh, so when are you going to play you know when, when uh, you, you know to, to be totally <laughs> honest um I, i'm, I'm going to do the shinny league the shin not league the shinny hockey on thursdays um and depending on what happens with the podcast um or the news portion or whatever with what i do for the shl i don't want to stop that yep. do you know what i mean as long as they want me to continue doing it i'm going to keep doing it so i don't plan on playing for the shl yeah. So I know a lot of guys say, well, you can play and do the same thing. No. For me to do, to make it what I want it, the, the show, to make it what I want it to be, yep. I kind of have to give that 100%. So, yeah, maybe I play for the, if the, if it, if I'm asked, I might play for the Bangkok Ice Hockey League. If I'm not asked, it's no big deal. But I definitely will probably do the, the shinny hockey. So I suppose it would be difficult to give yourself player of the game and interview yourself. Hey, uh, <laughs> yeah, all right. Yeah, yeah, I might get it every week then, you know. So <laughs> You never know. But, uh, yeah, it's awesome, and, and I see a, a bright future. Uh, I see, you know, with with the social side and, and uh, what obviously with what you're doing, the exposure side, mm -hmm. I, I see only uh, growth and, and um, you know, I think we've got a, a good team in place to, to do it. So I'm, I'm happy to play and I'm, I'm lucky to play, you know, in, in a league such as this. Mm -hmm. yeah. Excellent. Yeah. I'm it, like I said, watching you guys play has kind of showed me what hockey was supposed to be about again. And it, it I see it's fun. And yep. now I'm kind of like, Grassroots. I, yeah, I want to get. I want to get my skates when I go. I want to get some skates when I go back to America. Um, and then Scott said he was going to help me get some. Had said before he was going to help me get some equipment. And then what I'll do is eventually piece by piece replace everything with my own equipment and stuff yeah. like that. But yeah. I definitely. Yeah, definitely. I mean that's that's the one other thing. Um, like any sport, like anything, anywhere in the world, you get you get a lot of personalities mm -hmm. and and a lot of. Um, uh, hard personality, shall we call them? Yeah. Uh, that show up. Um, for, I think for anything in Thailand, A types or, or whatever, and and you know, frankly, dickheads <laughs> have come here. You know, with all due respect, and and they start playing that way, and they start playing as if they're in some parts of North America where mm -hmm. that's not only acceptable, but that's just the way they play. And you know what happens here, and it's just sort of the Thai touch, and and. 
I'd say, importantly, what the Flying Farangs as an organization, a lot of the core guys does, has mellowed these people out very quickly because they okay. realize, hey, there's no point in being a dickhead here. Yeah. You know, like this is actually Absolutely. fun. This is actually done for the right reasons. Mm -hmm. And, you know, mellow out. Like, like ha have fun. You know, do it right. And, and, you know, even the beers that we have or beverages, shall we say, <laughs> after... Um, after the ring, it, it's it's basically you know under the rink you know in a in a parking lot you uh -huh. know which, John I remember seeing Johnny there going you know he's used to the cocktail <laughs> lounges yeah. and and uh, but he he even said by the end you know, I like this you know you're drinking thirty bot Leos with cars whipping around yeah. and it's just, it's just chaos yeah. everywhere and and that that is an important part of it and I think I've even seen <clears throat> some guys recently uh, who have mellowed out, you know, in, in, in their way. And, and, and uh, yeah, I think it's a disarming uh, element that we bring to it. So Awesome. Okay, I'm going to have to call an end to the, the show. It's awesome. been awesome. Uh, one of the things I like to do at the end of every show is a thing called Always Remember. And okay. that's basically to leave my listeners and my viewers with something positive. It could be anything. Um, but another thing that I like to do when I have a guest... Oh. I forgot to tell you about this at the beginning, uh -oh. is I like to ask my guests to do and always remember. And like I said, it could be anything positive, you know, and it could be something related to hockey. It could be something related to being living in Thailand or Bangkok. It could, you know, just something positive. So you just like always remember, da 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 da, -da and I, I forgot to warn you about this. But if you would prefer not to do that, I completely understand. One person has, has requested not to do that, and that one person is my wife. So that's how that, they... Declining has started. De denying to do that has started. So, but uh, uh, if you could do the always remember for my listeners, that would be awesome. Uh well, I'll just keep it simple. Always remember who your friends and family are. And um, you know, I, I've been lucky uh, to travel to to have lots of friends uh, across different borders, different cultures. Um, and you know, I, I if I throw a barbecue at my place you know you're gonna get 50 people showing up not because you know i'm calling people but that's that's you know i have a lot of different friends mm -hmm. in different places and um you know it's very important to me but always remember you know people who care and you know your, your family it's it's everything to you and um you know it's it's sort of a um, feng shui you know what you you give is what you get mm -hmm. and i believe in karma and i'm not going to go all superstitious <laughs> on you but I think that's been part of a, a mantra for my life, and it's no fluke that I've ended up in a place uh, that is a bit spiritual. You mm -hmm. know, the Thais and, and Buddhism, and my wife's Buddhist. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I don't believe... I, I believe in that. So um, remember remember who's close to you, and, and uh, yeah, be positive. Especially in... Uh, we haven't gotten to politics, and you don't want to go there. No, 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 no. I, I, tr but, I try to uh, stay away from politics We need it, we need general, it now so. more than ever, uh, I would say. Uh, we need it now more than ever in this world. Awesome. So. All right. Well, thanks a lot. Thanks for having me, Dom. I, I love what you do, and um, yeah. Uh, it's my pleasure. So, all right. Cheers. Thanks for the beer, too. Oh, awesome. <laughs> no problem. Thanks a lot. Right. It's time for SHL News. So we've just finished off week nine. In our first game at 8.30, we had Aware facing off against the Sukhumvit Spitfires. Aware were coming into this game on a three-game losing streak. To get themselves back on the winning track, they need Yves Gabarro to remain strong between the pipes. They also need Brendan Vick and Patrick Lumbeck to keep up their strong play, but they also need Devin Michael, Corey Day, and Darren Boodle to pick up their game by putting more quality shots on the net. Sukhumvit Spitfires were coming into this game on a two-game winning streak, and it looks like they have found their substitute goalie in Lance Parker, whom has been really strong between the pipes. For them to continue building on this winning streak, they need their key players, Adrian Myers, Harrison Oostemel, and Donnie Kerfoot to keep their game strong, and they also need Ernest Bauer, Scott Murray, Obe Charanek, and David Bohr to start picking up their game and cycling the puck more. To start this game, Aware are still missing the Thai players from the Thai national team, as well as missing Corey and Eves with Gabarro replacing Eves between the pipes. Sukhumvit Spitfires are still missing Brad Wilson and Jason Kotzmeyer due to injuries, but they are also missing Garrett Howden this week. This game started out with play going back and forth between both ends of the rink, and Gabor and Lance both being walls in the nets. At the end of the first period, 
These two evenly matched teams were still 0-0, with Aware having six shots and the Sukhumvit Spitfires having seven. The first period also saw Aware doing an amazing job killing the holding penalty that Scott Whitcomb received. The second period saw the Sukhumvit Spitfires peppering Gabor with 11 shots, and Aware sending six shots at Lance. Gabor was given a delay of game penalty at 7-10 when he knocked the net off its spots. Again, Aware did a great job killing this penalty. The first goal of the game came with Brendan finding Darren and putting the puck past Lance with 50 seconds left in the period. At 16-10 of the third period, the Sukhumvit Spitfires answered back with a goal from Donnie, which was assisted by Dave McBurney. At 11.30, Aware take the lead again with a goal from Brendan Vick, which was assisted by Christian Olofsson. Things were looking done for the Sukhumvit Spitfires until there was 1 minute and 12 seconds left in the game when Top scored an unassisted goal, forcing a 3-on-3, 4-minute overtime period. The Sukhumvit Spitfires pretty much controlled the play, spending most of the time in the aware's end. At 2.41, Dougal Monk gets a pass from Donnie to get the game winner. The final score of the game was aware 2 with 18 shots and the Sukhumvit Spitfires 3 with 28 shots. Dave McBurney was the Rolling Stone player of the game for his incredible defensive play as well as his assist to Donnie's game-tying goal. I have the Rolling Stone player of the game, Dave McBurney. Congratulations. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Great game. Overtime again, winning it against the aware. I know. It just seems that every time we play these guys, it comes down to the last uh, couple of seconds, you know, and a bit of OT. Um, you know, we got down. Good comeback by the squad. Our goalie played great and uh, all around good win. Excellent. So now I got a, a, a non hockey question for you. Who do you want for the Super Bowl? Well, you know, I'm a big Hawk fan, so um, obviously they're not in it this year, but uh, I'm going with the underdog. Go with Atlanta. I like Atlanta. I like their chances. And uh, yeah, it's good to mix things up in that league, yeah? Excellent. Thanks a lot. Congratulations. Uh, appreciate Our it. Second yeah. game of the night at 9 30 was Sport Corner Titanium facing off against Hooters Nana. Sport Corner Titanium went into this game on a four game winning streak. To keep this going, Gabor needs to keep, continue to keep his head in the game. Also, John Silky Mitschiknowski will need to keep up his point streak by notching a point in every game, as well as solid play work from both Zach Garofolo and Mike Wilson. Their defense are going to have to keep strong and continue preventing the opposition from getting any good scoring opportunities. Hooters Nano went into this game on a two-game losing streak. To break out of this slump, they will need to find some solid goaltending from one of the substitute goaltenders in the league. They will also need Paul Stoddart, Steven Sproul, Andy Brine, and Justin St. Denis to get back on track and getting some points, as well as La, Michael White, to step up their game. The start of this game saw a pop in the net in place of Dream, who, along with the other Thai national players, is still out of the SHL. Things looked really good at the start of the game, and then Gary Crosby got a tripping penalty at 15 minutes. With 30 seconds left in the penalty, D.J. Sherman scored an unassisted power play goal. One minute later, Ben dolgan Gornier slipped one pass pop, with the assist going to Joe Lamantia. The third and final goal of the period came with 2.30 left in the period by Zach Garofolo, which was assisted by Silky Mitz and Mike Wilson. Things just kept rolling for Sport Corner Titanium as Mike scored his second goal of the game at 13.20, with the assist going to Zach. At 10.26, DJ was called for interference. At 8.55, Mike scored a shorthanded goal for Sport Corner Titanium. At 4.55, Sport Corner Titanium scored their sixth goal by Silky Mitz, which was assisted by Mike and Zach. At 2.45, Sport Corner Titanium scored their third and final goal, and a hat trick for Mike, with the assist going to Silky Mitz. Hooters Nana finally seemed to hit their stride here in the third period. They scored their first goal at 14 minutes, which came from top Ruttapong, which was assisted by Paul and Tomi. At 11.40, Pratch was called for tripping, which set up the power play goal by Alexander Gilbert, which was assisted by Andy Brine. With just seconds left in the game, Hooters Nana scored their third goal by Justin, which was assisted by Michael White and Tomey. The final score of the game was Sport Corner Titanium, 7 with 34 shots, and Hooters Nana, 3 with 22 shots. The Rolling Stone player of the game was Mike Wilson again. And get ready, girls. He was shirtless in this one also. I have the Rolling Stone player of the game again, second week in a row. 
Mike, congratulations. Thank you, sir. Five points. Wow. <laughs> uh, we we're getting some good bounces tonight, uh, but we had a good cycle game, and I was the beneficiary of some, some good work by our team, so I'll take it. <laughs> well, you did an excellent job. Now I've got a question for you, non-hockey related. Do you like uh, American football? Yeah, 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 for sure. Who are you going to pick for the Super Bowl? I'm torn. I, I kind of want the underdog and the Falcons, but I kind of want uh, I kind of also want uh, Brady to, you know, give Goodell maybe a, a shot when he gets the trophy. So I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm in two worlds at this one. All right. All right. Well, excellent. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Going into week 10, in our first game at 830, we have Hooters Nana facing off against the Aware. Hooters Nana will be coming off of a three-game losing streak. To fix this, they are definitely going to need some strong goaltending from one of the league's substitute goalies, be it James Cox, Nang, or Pop, or one of the other substitute goalies in the league. They will also need to see continued solid play from their top guys like Paul and Steven. They'll also need their next level guys, Andy, Justin, Michael, and La, to step it up a bit. Where will be coming into this game on a four-game losing streak? with this past week being an overtime loss to the Sukhumvit Spitfires. To break this streak, Eves will need to remain strong between the pipes, as well as Brandon and Patrick to keep the, the strong game play as well. They'll also need to see their second level guys, Devin, Darren, and Corey, to step it up a bit as well. In our second game, at 9.30, we'll have our top two teams, the Sukhumvit Spitfires, going head-to-head -head with Sport Corner Titanium. The Sukhumvit Spitfires are coming into this game on a three-game winning streak. We just found out this week that the Spitfires will be without their goaltender, Jason Kotzmeyer, for the rest of the season due to a torn MCL. If their replacement netminder is Lance, he will need to keep up his amazing play in the net. The next thing they will need to do is to stop the likes of Silky Mitz, Mike Wilson, and Zach Garofolo. Lastly, they will need to see their top guys, Donnie, Adrian, and Harrison to step it up, as well as their second-level guys, Ernesto, Scott, Obe, Dave McBurney, and David Bohr, to contribute as well. Sport Corner Titanium is on an amazing streak right now with winning their last five games. Silky Mitz is on a record run with getting points in every game so far this season to give him 26 points. For them, to win this, they will need to not look past the Spitfires and keep up their great teamwork on all fronts. And that's all for now, and I'll see you at the rink.